Pastor Reverend John, who has recently returned from CSL convention in Las Vegas, refreshed, reinvigorated, and revitalized. Oh, yeah. Reverend John, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so good morning. Good morning, beautiful Temple of Light family. Good morning to all those who join us in consciousness on the World Wide Web. A joy to add my own words of welcome and to be back home. It's always a joy to return to beautiful Jamaica. The temperature in, in Las Vegas was wonderful, though. 70, 65, comfortable, but very, very dry. So I returned last Sunday and from the convention. And it had, a, a, had as its theme, from surviving to thriving. All the presentations were geared toward giving ministers, practitioners, and the laity the tools we need to make our churches and our own lives centers of social and spiritual growth. I came away with many useful ideas, which I will share with you in the coming weeks. But one thing that really struck me, and which I want to explore with you today, is the significant difference this teaching can make in our lives. I arrived at Planet Hollywood Hotel, the venue of the convention, and of course the lobby was teeming with people, checking out or in, as in my case. I joined a line for the registration desk, and as soon as I went up to the clerk, she beamed at me, and before I could give her my name on, and my passport, she said, spiritual living? I said, all the time. <laughs> I had a fleeting thought that this was a bit odd that I hadn't presented my passport or anything, and yet still, out of all the people at the registration desk, she had, she had spotted that. But you know how it is, I've been up from three in the morning, it's now seven o'clock in the evening, Jamaica time, it was just four o'clock, um, um, Nevada time, and I wanted to get to my room, so I didn't pursue it. Well, the next morning at the opening of the convention, the very first presenter related the same experience when he was checking in. He told us how this nice girl named Anna registered him the evening before, and that as soon as he walked up to the desk, she correctly guessed, spiritual living convention? So he asked, how do you know? To which she replied, and I quote, my co-worker and I have been playing at guessing who the spiritual living guests are, and so far we have been 100% correct. <laughs> so he said, but how? And she replied, it shows. Wow. It shows, folks. Maybe it was showing when all those very scantily um, clad ladies were inviting me. Want to go to a party? <laughs> They're, they're, they're a very friendly people, <laughs> the people in Las Vegas. I said, spiritual living. <laughs> and in my mind, I hope to God you don't catch cold in that little Victoria's Secret thing. <laughs> Do mesh stockings keep you warm? <laughs> it shows, folks. There is something about the way we interact with life that touches, cheers, and inspires others. It shows. And two wonderful people in the very front row this morning are wearing matching t-shirts that say, God-centered. Let us just all say that together. God-centered. Yes, it shows. The late great soul, Mahandas Mahatma Gandhi, once made a powerful statement. Evidently, a reporter had posed a question to Gandhi. He said, tell us, Mr. Gandhi, what is your message? Gandhi looked at him for a moment and then replied simply, my life is my message. As we know, Gandhi's life was indeed an inspiring message of love, peace, compassion, and truth. But in a very real sense, our own lives also convey a strong message to those we come in contact with on life's journeys. And so I've titled today's encouragement, as I call my messages, Your Life is Your Message. A few nights ago, you know, I stood in, in my garden looking up at the night sky, and it occurred to me that the great contributors to humankind, Gandhi, Mozart, Leonardo da Vinci, Plato, Socrates, 
as well as spiritual masters and way showers, such as Jesus and Buddha, stood and gazed up at the same sky. I wondered what thoughts ran through their minds regarding their purpose here, the message of their lives, and their connection to the universe. Visualize for a moment with me that you are sharing sacred space with those people who came before you and made a difference. In so many ways, they contributed to who you are and what you have today. Just think, you are breathing the same atoms that those individuals breathed. Realize, too, that you also shall pass those atoms on to some other person who will probably live thousands of years from now. What is the gift you will give them? What is the message of your life? This kind of visualization puts life into a new perspective, doesn't it? My friends, life is a sacred continuum where everything touches at some point. And of course, that point is not subject to time or to matter, because it is energy. It's all energy in motion. And in truth, it is all happening in the eternal and everlasting now, which is the only time we have. So think about it. The ideas that moved through Leonardo da Vinci's mind became the templates for inventions yet to be given form, many of which we enjoy today. Jesus and Buddha realized that the universe was totally interconnected and that we all share the same common ground, the common ground of infinite life, infinite existence. Nothing changes but form. Essentially, we are all one, all one. We are all connected. And we always have been and always will be. The profound implication of this idea is compelling to contemplate that what affects one of us affects us all for all eternity. Make no mistake about it. What you believe and what you think, what you say and what you do and how you reach out today will touch those yet to come in significant ways. Every person has a belief, a personal belief system, a set of deeply ingrained ideas that color our perceptions of life. And even though we may not be consciously aware of it, we all operate on certain basic assumptions about ourselves, about other people, and about the nature of reality. Many of these ideas are instilled by parents or early uh, caregivers and you would be amazed at the extent to which many of us still accept the views of life held by those early shapers of our character. Many of us have built our entire life on the mistaken belief instilled in early life that if you want good, your nose must run, meaning success only comes through struggle. Another erroneous and ominous idea intoned by a well-meaning grandma was that if you are too happy, it forebodes some kind of disaster. You know that one we say in Jamaica? Chicken Mary, hog denier. By the way, in, in, in uh, the Grand Canyon, we saw some large hawks. Uh, I, think they, I think they were actually crows, right, Tony? Yes. These beliefs make up a kind of inner roadmap to life and your life experiences flow and follow that map faithfully, going only where that map allows, unless you consciously make the choice to alter the map. There's a great story that illustrates this, which I want to share with you. Once upon a time, a starving, pregnant tigress died giving birth to her cub. A flock of goats came upon the motherless newborn and adopted him. He grew up bleating and eating grass and believed himself to be a goat. One day, a large male tiger pounced on the flock and the goats scattered. The young cub remained in place because he recognized something dimly familiar about the larger animal. Amazed, the adult tiger asked if the cub actually lived among the goats. 
Maha, bleated the tiger. Ma! The adult tiger was mortified at this poor specimen of his species. The little guy kept bleating and nibbling grass, so the big tiger took him to a still pond where the cub saw his own face for the very first time. You're no goat, the big tiger told him. You're a tiger like me. He led the little tiger to a den and offered him the remains of a recently slaughtered gazelle. <laughs> no way, said the little guy. I, I, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> Nonsense, said the big guy, as he shoved a chunk of meat down the small throat. <laughs> the little tiger gagged. However, when a small piece of meat entered the little tiger's system, he stretched. He bared his teeth. And then he opened his mouth wide, and for the first time, he let out a tiny roar. <laughs> OK, now come, you have to help me with this story. I need a loud roar here. So get your little clothes out, take a deep breath, and on the count of three, let us all roar together. One, two, three, roar! I'm not convinced. <laughs> Take a deep breath. And roar! Wow. And with that great roar, the little tiger went off into the jungle, and with his new mentor, he lived happily ever after. We are all tigers, living as goats up until now. That roar is the roar of awakening. When we are told you were created in the image and likeness of God, the idea may seem too big, and you may gag on it. You can't seem to take it all in. Me? Little old me? Try taking in just a little nibble. Let the idea begin to transform your awareness and your life. If you haven't taken a science of mind class or haven't taken one for a long time, join us on Tuesday evenings from 7 to 9 or on Thursday mornings from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. and take a little nibble of truth. And you will be amazed at the difference your awakening can make. I have invited Kelly Tomlin, one of our Tuesday night class participants, to give you a little nibble of how this teaching has helped her on her journey. Kelly, ah, there she is. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> Just a little nibble. Good morning. <laughs> I was hiding. I hope you wouldn't see me and forget about it. Can't miss the shoes. I know. When, when uh, Reverend John asked me if I wanted to share, you know, you're always a little hesitant, but I knew I owed him because there was a, a time before there was a little confusion in my office, and I said I wouldn't, and I didn't, so I knew I owed him. But the other reason that it was a little overwhelming or, was because he said, well, yeah, after I said yes, my title is going to be, you know, your life is your testimony. I said, okay, my life is my testimony, and for most of us, including me, sometimes that's an overwhelming thought. The idea that my life demonstrates to the level of which I've accepted God in my life. And for some areas, I'm really, all right, I've got that. I've accepted God. God's fully present in that area of my life. And in some areas, not so much. But the idea that my life is my testimony is an overwhelming one at times, but can be very powerful. And you, like me, perhaps, remember things a little bit better when you have uh, a little mnemonic. And I, I thought about this and thought, our. So, if my life is truly my testimony, that requires a lot of responsibility behind it because it's so easy to blame circumstances or the economy or the government, somebody else and everybody else but yourself. And if I truly am, which I have to own 100%, as Reverend John just said, a child of the Almighty, a child of God, then what is not possible for my life? And what is my testimony saying if I'm not demonstrating God in all my life? I'm not bearing witness to the power and presence of God. So that became overwhelming, but I said the O and R is I have to own it. After I own, I have to understand it, and that's the reason I came back to a foundations class, because you know it takes study, and I told uh, Reverend John that I came to get fed, and I'm very thirsty. 
a lot for spiritual healing and spiritual messaging and really doing the work. So in the area of understanding it, you know, going back to Matthew who said, everything you request in prayer, but also believe shall be yours. And the requesting is really easy. Yes, Lord, please give me, give me, give me. But the idea that it is mine, and the belief that is mine, and the understanding of that, I think, is much more difficult. And we're reminded that in our foundations class. And my parents are here today, and some of the messages that I was, I was taught. <laughs> yeah, there are no coincidences. When Reverend John asked me to speak, I forgot, oh, my parents will be here. That makes it even worse. But <laughs> the ideas that I learned early on in Becca United Baptist about the I idea of prayer and knocking the door will be open come up a time and time again. But we have to do our work. So the OUR and understanding requires something from us. And the one that I've learned this week and I'm really meditating on is the idea really, really of reminders. And I loved, are you ready to receive? And that's a child mnemonic, but it, for me it works. And this idea of every day coming saying, whatever it is, God is all powerful and God is here. I am the child of the almighty and I own that. And for whatever thing is in the way, I don't see it. Thank you and so it is. But we have to have so many reminders because there's so many false prophets and so many false messages that say you are less than. And we have to remind each other that we are not less than, that prosperity is ours because God said it was ours. I came and I came to give life abundantly. So we have to really work with each other and for each other to do the reminding every day. I see the beauty in you. I see the God in you and lift ourselves up. So it came back for me, full circle for home, and I can tell you a whole story about how Jamaica has really brought me home, which, you know, wouldn't be self-evident to home to West Virginia, but it has, and it's really brought me, brought me back to the same ideas I grew up with, you know, just a, just a little talk with Jesus, I want to know more, and the idea about there will be showers of blessing, and I think what I've come to know in my adult stage is that, yes, there will be showers of blessing. I don't have to beg. I don't have to cajole, and the foundation of mind is reminding me. I just have to accept them, and they are mine. So thank you, Uncle John. Oh, you are. She could give up her day job. Yeah. <laughs> and mom and dad, welcome. You did a wonderful job. And I see that beauty runs in the family. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. So this brings me to your assignment. Of course. Your assignment, your assignment, should you decide. I like your assignment, should you decide to take it is to jot down in a sentence or two how this teaching has helped you on your journey through life. And it's a now assignment. So I want you to turn to the inside back cover of your program, which says reflections. And just in a sentence or two, right now, write down how this teaching has helped you on your journey. I'm going to give you two minutes to do it. We see when I give them the assignment to do at home, they have every good intention. Yeah. And then the rice and peas and chicken takes over on a Sunday afternoon. How has this teaching been helping you on your journey? You know, two minutes is a very long time. Now, after service, I want you to tear off that little jotting 
and drop it in the mahogany box in the vestibule before leaving church this morning. We're going to post your thoughts on our Facebook page so you don't have to put your name or your full name. Ah, that's nice. Uh, uh, you, you anticipated me. And if you don't, um, if you have electronic devices, then you can also email it to us. And if you're not here at church in beautiful Jamaica, do share how truth has been helping you and email it to us at templeoflight at cwjamaica.com. That's templeoflight at cwjamaica.com. And in the subject field of your email, just write S-O-M and me. So when it comes, I'll know. Friends, people who have chosen the path of ancient wisdom known as new thought share the Eastern notion that God dwells within each person as their essential self. Many enlightened Western theologians also share that belief. Meister Eckhart, the German Catholic mystic, for example, wrote, and I quote, God is not found in the soul by adding anything but by a process of subtraction, unquote. This, by the way, is the purpose of meditation, which is a means of subtracting the chatter in our minds that is constantly producing our goat experience so that we can see in the, in, into the inner pool of God consciousness our true reflection as a tiger. If you are brought up to believe that you are a goat, you will think, speak, and respond to life like a goat, even though you were born a, a glorious tiger. Your beliefs concerning your own abilities and your highest potential are therefore of paramount importance in determine how, determining how much prosperity, success, and well-being radiate from your center to fill your life. They're like the parchment on which your inner mental map is printed, making it difficult for you to move beyond the self-limitations you have placed on your life by your own deeply held convictions, just as you will be challenged when traveling to find your way to destinations beyond the edges of a road map. Eric Butterworth, the New Thought Luminary, writes in his classic work, Discover the Power Within You, and I quote, life is growth and unfoldment, and life is lived from inside out. How few people really know that. The average person lives his life from outside in. He frustrates his, his, his potential when he lets his level of consciousness be determined by what people say, what conditions appear to be, what he reads in the newspapers or sees on the television. He becomes little more than a barometer that registers the conditions of his world then he is caught up in the dilemma of whether to conform to the world around him or to spend his life resisting it, unquote. Jesus the Christ declared, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. It really doesn't matter what happens around you in the outer world because you have been given the power to overcome the world. What really matters is what happens where within you, your thoughts, your belief system about yourself and about every other self. Butterworth notes that there is a belief deeply rooted in the collective unconscious of the race mind that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can't change human nature. He urges us to reject this mistaken idea for the lie that it is, and he used urged us to catch Jesus' concept of the divinity that's within each and every one of us. And so friends, that is the mission of our church, to teach people of the divinity that is inherent in all people. Our mission is transforming lives, and we do it by giving people the tools they require to live as we were meant to live, as thriving members of the royal household of God. The next time you feel like bleating, stop for a moment. And to help you remember your spiritual magnificence, go outdoors and look up. Contemplate your unity with the infinite and allow yourself to feel the sense of wonder in the fact that only 
a cosmic heartbeat. Only a blink in eternity has passed since your brother Jesus and other ancient masters did the very same thing. Look up, breathe deeply, and roar, I am that I am. Let's say that together. I am that I am. And if someone should ask you today or any day, tell me, what is your message? I pray that you will be able to respond with deep humility, joy, and gratitude. My life is my message. Namaste.